Well, good morning, good afternoon, good day. I'm going to be brave and put myself on webcam. Feel free to bring that down if that's something that's distracting or not helpful to you otherwise. So you, you don't have to have that as part of your experience today. Um, thank you for being willing to learn about the topic of human trafficking. Um, before I start, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and that is and set, to set the context for this uh, webinar, this presentation, this Melton share today. I have been practicing uh, as a clinical social worker, working with children and families for 20 years. And through that time, I've had exposure to the area of human trafficking, victims of human trafficking. I've done a lot of work, I've had a lot of leadership in my state and even at the national level around human trafficking. That being said, um, it, it's very rare that someone considers himself or herself an expert of human trafficking, and I would be the same, that I, it would be hard for me to consider myself that because I'm an ally. An ally is someone who supports those who have survived human trafficking. The true leaders uh, and experts are those who have themselves survived and then through their uh, survival then thrive and become leaders in the process to help others who've gone through the same issue. Um, a couple of the things I want to make sure that I point out is that this is in, in the 30 or so minutes that I'm going to present before we take questions, I'm going to give you a crash course in human trafficking. I'm going to give you some depth and I'm going to give you some breadth. But this is a topic that you could spend days and days in seminars and uh, years researching and still feel like you're just beginning to, to scratch the surface because it's a very complex issue. Um, so I'm hoping what I do is I give you enough information to begin a conversation in your internal process and then with those around you around the issue of human trafficking to increase your awareness uh, and to increase hopefully your passion and your, your commitment to recognizing it, responding to, and best case scenario, preventing it, the issue of human trafficking. I also like to talk with people whenever I'm presenting on a topic like this that human trafficking uh, is sexual and abusive in nature, and because of that, it can trigger issues for people. Even if you don't have your own personal trauma history and you don't know that this is an issue that can trigger you, sometimes just discussing the nature of, of trauma can trigger something in your own process, your own compassion or your own vis visceral awareness. If you of, decide to go on and read about this topic or um, talk to others about it, that, that you can find that you will, even for me, a seasoned veteran of 20 years, sometimes I'll be exposed through reading or in talking with a client a certain trauma story and it can create a response in me. So if that happens for you today or at any point that you're engaging and learning about this topic, feel free to take care of yourself, to step away from the subject for a while, to, to turn off the sound if that's necessary. That being said, I'm not going to say anything really graphic or expose you to anything visually that's graphic today. That's not that's not my um, goal to shock or, or to disturb you, but I just want you to be aware of that. I also want you to be aware of the power of language when it comes to human trafficking. Part of what's been most powerful in the change in our approach to human trafficking is to move from thinking of folks as um, simply maybe criminals in the case of sexual trafficking or as, you know, poor people who in labor trafficking to really think of them in terms of being victimized and targeted in a systemic way in a, in a way that impacts all of our cultures and economies. So using language like victim um, or survivor helps us to frame that and when we use that language it helps us to give a sense of hope and also compassion for those who've been victimized through this process. So let me see if I can get to my next slide now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so throughout my, my time um, as a social worker, I have been exposed to victims of human trafficking, but I didn't always frame it that way. I didn't always think of them as victims of human trafficking. Now, I had enough uh, support around me and enough supervision that I never um, thought of them necessarily as bad people or bad kids or, or didn't understand that they were victims, but I didn't understand the context of human trafficking. I understood that there were people who were sexually abused in a certain way. Um, I understood that there were kids who, when they ran away, were victimized in a certain way. But it's still, it was still within this kind of 
non-contiguous, non-connected fashion. I didn't understand that there was a, a bigger pattern working underneath. Thankfully, in my state, there's been a lot of leadership in the area of recognizing the issue of human trafficking, which is kind of ironic because I live in a very rural state, right in the middle of the U.S. Whenever kids from around the world ask me where I live, it doesn't make any sense to them when they hear where I live because I'm not in New York, I'm not in Los Angeles, I'm not in D.C., I'm not in Florida. People really don't know where Kansas is. I'm in a very rural area. My whole state only has a couple of million um, inhabitants. But despite that, we're a human trafficking corridor because we're in the middle of the United States and main highways and interstates run through Kansas, which makes us prime territory for drug trafficking and also human trafficking. And there's a lot of correlation between drug trafficking and human trafficking, especially in PIP controlled trafficking. So in the last five to seven years, I've really had more and more opportunity to recognize human trafficking as a distinct field a distinct pattern of victimization to understand the context in which it occurs and begin to uh, participate in some initiatives to do some prevention work as well as some response and service work to victims of human trafficking. And so I consider myself an ally to those who've been victimized to support them in their own healing and their process, knowing that they're really the true, um, they're the true leaders in the field when they're given the opportunity to end the support to move from victimization to really thriving and surviving and, and leading. Um, so talk, I want to talk a little bit about the scope and I won't throw a lot of statistics at you because we can really swim there for a while and I think that, that that's something that you probably want to get as you dive deeper into this topic. But just to give the broad scope of, of human trafficking, um, an estimate from Polaris Project, which is one of the authorities on the topic, is up to about 21 million men, women, and children are trafficked for sex or labor around the world today. And all experts in the field will tell you when it comes to statistics, uh, no one feels confident in them, that there's just not a good way to categorize trafficking victims. There's not a good pattern of collecting that data. Um, it's such an intrinsic and pervasive problem, it's really hard to pinpoint. And a lot of people who are victims of trafficking don't consider or self-identify as victims of trafficking, which makes it even more difficult. But just to see that this is a broad set, spread problem um, around the world, across gender and age. Um, I want to make clear the difference between sexual exploitation and labor trafficking and talk a little bit about some definitions and also examples. Now when I talk about sexual exploitation, the old word that we don't use anymore that people tend to think of and recognize is the word prostitution. We don't use the word prostitution in the anti-human trafficking movement because prostitution is a criminal charge. It doesn't recognize the victimization of the person who is being exploited in that situation. So sexual exploitation isn't just pimp controlled trafficking. It, there are many different ways that a person can be sexually exploited. Anytime a person's uh, body is exchanged for something of value, in other words it doesn't have to be money, it could be drugs, it could be for food, it could be for a place to sleep, but it's done so that someone else can be sexually gratified. And the reason I say sexually gratified is not because I'm trying to use very gentle language, it's because it doesn't have to be physical contact. It can be pornography, it can be coercing someone to take a picture of, uh, of themselves and post it on the internet, it can be um, videoing, it can be a lot of different things, it, stripping, that kind of thing, that can be a form of sexual exploitation. With labor, um, and you'll see a distinction here and I'll talk more about it later, with labor this looks like someone being forced, fraud or coerced into providing labor services. So a common dynamic that we see in immigrant populations is that they're promised a job and their papers, any papers that they have that give them identity and give them rights to move around, are then held by the person who is trafficking them in labor and they constantly develop more debt as they make more money. So for example, if they work for $10 a day, the trafficker will say, okay, you made $10 today, but you owe me $5 for the hotel, and you owe me $5 for food, and guess what, you owe me $5 for gas, so actually you owe me more money than you made today. And it becomes this cycle of being an indentured servant that makes it impossible for them to leave. 
so that can just that can happen in a lot of different places, but in the U.S. we see it mostly in domestic servitude, so that's maids, domestic help, sales crews, and food service. The sales crews, um, I don't know if this occurs in other places, but in the U.S. it's pretty common that you'll see uh, these individual or sometimes two at a time youth and they're usually very young maybe 17 to 20 years old who will walk around neighborhoods and they'll purport that they're selling magazines or cologne or books or something like that and that they're trying to earn a scholarship and and you can see that these are not probably kids who are trying to earn a scholarship to school but you're and you're afraid of being scammed usually but you're not sure what's going on well, what we know now is one of the largest labor trafficking sales crews rings is run out of um, just over the state line from Kansas is Missouri is run out of Missouri, um, but it's very hard to nail down the people who are trafficking in labor this way, despite the fact that they're making millions of dollars and they're leaving uh, kids very vulnerable in these situations. Again, keep taking their papers, taking all of their personal identifying documents, and not giving them any money. So they can't get home and and uh, putting them in a position of, of being exploited for the financial gain of another. So I'm going to get a little bit closer to home real quick and if we were here in a group we would talk out loud but I just want you to have an internal exercise real quick and I want you to think about your life when you were 12 to 14 years old. Think about where you were in school, think about what your priorities were, what your expertise was, decisions you were making, the supports you had around you, um, how smart and clever you were, how smart and clever you thought you were. Um, just think about that whole context, how insightful you were, what you knew about the world. For just a couple seconds. And the reason that I'm bringing up this age is because in the US the most common age of entry into the commercial sex industry is 12 to 14 years old. When I travel internationally people are often surprised that when I talk about human trafficking in the US I'm talking about domestic sexual exploitation of children because there's an assumption that yes we get immigrants and even go that some of some US citizens go abroad for sexual tourism with children um, but they're not aware that we exploit our very own children in the U.S. And the average age of entry is 12 to 14 years old for those who are being sexually exploited domestically in the U.S. And I want to talk a little bit about why 12 to 14. Why would they target 12 to 14 year olds? Well, for people who, tra who target victims, whether they be um, individual who coerce uh, sexual exploitation or those traffickers or pimps that are in in a more organized way um, sexually exploiting youth, I'm telling you they could lead a course in psychology in terms of how to identify potential victims and how to groom those victims towards being victimized. And what happens at 12 to 14 years old, and this isn't cultural, this is developmental across cultures, is at 12 to 14 years old an individual is really beginning to form and experiment with his or her identity. Up until about 12 years of old, 12 years of age, kids are pretty much following in their family's footsteps. I always say if their family wears cowboy boots, their kids wear cowboy boots. Well, around 12 years of age, those kids begin to explore. They see how other people live. They dress in different ways. They listen to different music. They see how other families live, go to other churches and places of worship. So they begin to experiment and do some field research about how people live. At the same time, their brain is very impressionable to identity development. So if a trafficker can get someone in this age range of 12 to 14 years of age, not only are they impressionable and easily swayed, not sophisticated, um, they're also able to imprint on them their identity. So if at 12 to 14 years of age a person begins being trafficked, that becomes in a neurobiological way a big part of how they identify themselves, how they see themselves, how they view the world. So it is a prime age developmentally for them to be targeted, which is very um, sad that as often is the case, the criminals, the traffickers, are ahead of those of us who are trying to protect these youth. So in the U.S. there's some initiatives to educate youth around uh, human trafficking and a lot of it is targeted at high school kids which is fine but when I talk with uh, groups I say that's fine but it's too late. We really need to be talking with our kids very early in age to talk about 
this way in which uh, they could potentially be victimized. So again, statistics are not um, considered incredibly reliable, but most experts agree on these statistics and accept these statistics that somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 domestic, in other words, U.S. citizens, um, youth, are at risk for commercial exploitation annually in the U.S. And I recommend at the bottom of this page a video. It's a five-minute video. Rachel Lloyd is a leader in New York in the Girls Education and Mentoring Services Anti-Human Trafficking uh, Continuum of Services. And this video talks about how someone is easily drawn into what is called the life, the life of being trafficked. Because it's not exactly how it's portrayed often in the media. There's a lot of different ways that people enter trafficking. It might, it can be that somebody is kidnapped and forced into a trafficking situation. But it can also be that someone pretends to be their boyfriend and gets to know them enough to know how to manipulate and make promises to them, slowly cuts them off from family and other support systems. It can be um, tied into domestic violence. There are a lot of different ways that human trafficking um, can occur for for young people and, and for people across the, the um, age spectrum. and. Also, finally, to note in this is that when you look at adult folks who are um, being trafficked, most of them entered at that 12 to 14 year age range. So even in the U.S. as we're progressively moving towards seeing minor uh, human trafficking victims as victims instead of criminals, once they turn 18, um, suddenly they're criminals. And can you imagine if something's been going on for five formative years of your life that suddenly when that magic day happens when you turn 18, do you think that suddenly you would uh, think differently, feel differently, be differently? No, of course, they're going to continue what they know and what's been entrenched in their self-identity. And at that point, they are easily charged as a criminal in most settings. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the risk factors. Gender is a risk factor for sexual trafficking, not so much for labor trafficking. Socioeconomic status is a big role, and this is true globally, that poor people, people who don't have a lot of economic means or status are much more likely to be trafficked. Runaway and homeless youth are much more likely to be targeted. In fact, one uh, survey said that within the first 24 hours, one in three runaway and homeless youth are um, targeted for potentially being trafficked. So if a kid's been on the street for more than a day or two, there's um, some pretty good odds that they've been approached around human trafficking. Individuals who are immigrants are more likely to be victimized, although, like I said, um, domestic Victimization is also uh, happening across the world. Ethnic and racial minorities are also more likely to be trafficked by and large. So, for example, we have a specialized unit I'll talk about later that serves victims of human trafficking. And on that unit, in, in our local context, we probably have a, about 10% African-American population. On that unit, we serve over 50% African-Americans. Um, they're just, they tend to be targeted and vulnerable. A history of foster care, so kids who had other disruptions, abuse and trauma in their life, and also abuse history. 70 to 90 percent of sexual trafficking victims have had a history of sexual abuse. And then fin finally, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth have a much higher rate of being trafficked. So what do all of these populations have in common, you might ask yourself. This, there's a big difference between race and abuse history and gender. Well, what they all have in common is that they have some inherent vulnerabilities that make them more able to be manipulated, coerced, or frauded, um, as well as fewer protective mechanisms of people who will step in when they see someone grooming them towards trafficking to say, hey, what's going on? Or when their kid is missing, to have the um, ability to step in and, and try to figure out what's happening in that child's life. So all of these come up to looking at folks who have a high level of vulnerabilities. And this also is true across the, um, across the globe, that these kind of vulnerabilities lead to a higher risk in trafficking. So a quick exercise, just again, within your own mind to think to yourself, imagine that um, someone holds a gun to your head. 
and tells you you have to rob a store. Or imagine that someone tells you that if you don't uh, steal a car, they're going to kill your dog or your mom or someone else that you love. Um, and then imagine you, 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 you do that act um, as a means of survival, of not getting killed, of not having other people get killed. You escape through some miracle and you run to the police officer, you run to law enforcement and you say, I've been through this horrible ordeal, um, this is what happened, and in response, the police officer puts you in jail and charges you with a crime. And you would say, but you don't know. This is how they coerced me. This is how they forced me. This is how they frauded me. But you would be charged with a crime. That's what it's like for human trafficking victims, or has been historically, is that despite the fact that they were forced, frauded, or coerced into um, sexual exploitation, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that isn't even necessary to prove, um, that we would have young people, children, that were charged with the crime of prostitution. In fact, immigrants and international victims had more protection under our federal government than our domestic victims did. That changed in 2000 with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or TVPA, in the U.S., and that began to address the fact that domestic victims were indeed victims and not criminals. Now, the role of force, fraud, or coercion was changed at that time, too. The difference is, is that historically, in order to say, hey, I'm not a perpetrator here, I'm a victim in sexual trafficking, force, fraud, or coercion had to be uh, demonstrated. So force would be like holding a gun. Fraud would be to say, oh, we're going to you know, do something else, and then, oh, guess what, I drug you, and this happens. Or coercion would be, I'm going to hurt somebody, I'm going to, you know, share a video of you that's very embarrassing. So force, fraud, or coercion had to be proven prior for a person not to be charged. With minor victims, 18 and younger, they no longer need to prove force, fraud, or coercion. And I actually have to talk with youth about this when we serve them for um, as, as victims of human trafficking. Often they don't identify themselves as victims. Often they identify that they got themselves into a situation or that they... Um, owe somebody money or that this is a boyfriend and this is a relationship dynamic so they don't necessarily identify as a victim but what I usually talk with them about is that at under 18 years of age they can't buy property they can't make legal decisions or sign legal documents they can't um, make other decisions for their own life by themselves so certainly they can't enter into this transaction of trading their body uh, for something of value and most of the victims um, can then begin to identify that, okay, yes, in other contexts, I wouldn't be able to make that kind of choice, so in this, this situation, I can't. In Kansas, again, with the leadership that has been shown uh, by so many in, in my area, uh, our laws have really been strengthened. And so people who are traffickers or who are buying sex uh, can be subject to criminal forfeiture, anything they've used or benefited from the act of crime. So if somebody is going to purchase sex from a child and they use their cell phone and they use their laptop to look up the child on a website and they went and they um, met with that child at their home, all of those things are up for criminal forfeiture, that those could be taken and sold and then given to the victim's assistance fund. Affirmative defense allows any minor who is, sometimes minors are still charged with human trafficking in the state of Kansas and the reason is is that in some cases they're in such danger or they themselves are so deep in the life of trafficking that they aren't going to choose to leave that um, in order to keep them as safe as possible they're put in a detention facility, in a juvenile detention facility. The affirmative defense allows that they cannot be convicted because they are under 18 years of age. So in other words they can be charged and held I mean, if it's seen in their best interest, but they cannot be convicted of that crime. So that's just a legal maneuvering to allow a, a greater depth and breadth of services. It is controversial because there is still that notion. I've, I've visited young women who are locked up who said, you're telling me I'm a victim, but I'm sitting here in an orange jumpsuit and being charged with a crime. So which is it? 
So it is still a complicated topic. We have training available. It's not mandatory, but we have a training uh, for law enforcement across our state. There's been a huge initiative that all officers are trained in recognizing and responding to human trafficking. And there's a mandate on all law enforcement that if they reasonably believe or suspect a child has been involved in human trafficking, that they must take that child into custody. And so when victims or alleged victims of human trafficking are picked up by police officers around the state. They're then assessed by a social worker and one of the options is for them to be placed in, in a staff secure unit. Now the staff secure unit is a very progressive and a model program that we run in my facility, the Wichita Children's Home. And the reason why is it provides an alternative to putting kids in a juvenile detention facility. It's staff secure because it's not a truly locked unit because you can't lock people up without charging them with a crime. But it has delay lock doors, keypad mechanisms, and has intensive staffing. At all times we have at least two staff and one police officer on the unit, even though we only generally serve one or two um, youth at a time. We have a very intensive staffing pattern to keep them safe and keep them present. I want to show you some pictures of what our staff secure unit look like, because you might wonder what could that could even look like, a place where we're holding victims of human trafficking for their own safety in the staff secure unit. These are just a few pictures. This was actually before we opened, so you'll see like there's still plastic on the lamp covers, that kind of thing. The door that shows push until alarm sounds, um, only one of our doors has that mechanism, but that's, a lot, that's one of the things that allows it to be not a locked unit, is that technically if the youth wants to leave, he or she can leave. They have the ability to leave. They each have an individual bedroom for their own safety and sense of safety, but otherwise it's like a normal residential unit. It has a living room feel. On the bottom right you see those kind of tall gray curtains. Well, what's open through there is an enclosed courtyard so they can go outdoors. And they, and they come to us for a period of three to six days and receive mental health assessment and services, substance abuse um, assessment and services other clinical and therapeutic services to begin their road to recovery. And what we find is sometimes we serve these victims in our other units because I work for an agency that's pretty broad in the services we provide. And they might be pretty tough on the other units, but when you get them to a safe, secure, calm unit, and you can see I've kind of used in the color palette blues and grays kind of like a spa color. It's meant to be calming and decompressing and safe and feel kind of secure. We keep the lighting low. We make it a, a very kind of comforting healing environment so they can begin their healing process. And what we find is that most youth are happy to be in that setting, although um, human trafficking victims are high run risks. They tend to run away a lot and then return to the life. We haven't had anyone run yet or attempt to run from this unit. And I think it's because it's a supportive, safe unit that speaks to them that they're not um, criminals, but that they're victims and we want to help them in their uh, healing process. So why traffic in people? Why, why, why engage in, in human trafficking? Why is it the fastest growing form of trafficking um, in the world behind drug and arms trafficking? Well, think about this. How many times can you sell a kilo of cocaine? How many times can you sell a machine gun? Um, what if you could cut one of the primary costs from your businesses, whether that be an illegal business or a legal business? And finally, what happens if you get pulled over and you have another person in the car with you? Are you immediately suspect because a person is in the car with you? No. If you're pulled over with drugs and then it's found, you're, you're immediately um, taken into custody. If you're pulled over and you have illegal arms, you're taken into custody. But if, you, if you're pulled over and you have a child in the car or another individual in the car, that doesn't necessarily make an individual at all suspect. In a, in um, and in addition to that, while you can sell a kilo of cocaine one time and then you have to get more cocaine, a human being you can sell over and over and over again and be paid repeatedly for the service he or she is providing, whether it be light labor or sexual trafficking. So in terms of a business model, it's um, very lucrative. And fi finally, when you look at labor trafficking, in almost any business, the primary expense, for example, in, in my business of nonprofit and child welfare, um, the actual staffing cost is easily 85% of our overall budget. 
because it's the human piece that takes a lot of money. We're not producing goods. Um, so what if you could cut that out in, say, in an agricultural setting or in another labor-intensive setting like a restaurant? That's one of the, the draws of labor trafficking. So you can see why trafficking in people, really for some people, some gangs in the U.S. who in the past have heavily relied on drug trade are moving to human trafficking because of these reasons, because you can sell somebody repeatedly, because um, it doesn't immediately alert any kind of issues just because a person's in the car with you. And, um, and finally, there's a ready supply. There are, in any community, kids who've been victimized, kids who are easily victimized, kids who are vulnerable to being trafficked because of the issues I spoke of earlier. Um, just to touch briefly on the culture around uh, trafficking and what, so, what makes it so pervasive and easy to happen, um, especially with sexual trafficking, gender and sexuality come heavily into play. Think about how we look at men and women in all of our individual cultures. Think of the value that we place on them. For women, the ability to be sexual in a healthy and acceptable way is very limited in even the most progressive of cultures, um, by and large. So that comes into play. Uh, the role of pornography also comes in because pornography is increasing the appetites of, of people increasingly to have a, to want sexual acts that their romantic partners will not provide, to wanting uh, more deviant sexual acts that include more violence, that include children. So it's increasing their level of sexual stimulation threshold, and they're needing more and more um, violent or uh, deviant acts in order to be sex sexually stimulated. So pornography is very dangerous. I know in most cultures it's legal, um, but Whenever you see pornography, you should be thinking about victimization. It is really um, part of the continuum of human trafficking victimization, and the vast majority of people who are shown in pornography, even if they are adults, were victimized sexually as youth. One um, leader in the anti-pornography movement who herself was a, is a pornography survivor says, the porn business is nothing more than a glamorous looking side to human trafficking, and I think that's very accurate. When you look at sexual exploitation, think of how victims are portrayed. You have the princess in the tower, someone who wants rescued. Well, guess what? When you go rescue some kid who's been surviving on the street and has been beat up and treated horribly, they're not necessarily welcoming you with open arms and, and acting like that. So then people are turned off by the 15-year-old who wants to say, forget you. There's also the Pretty Woman movie that came out, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s that showed human trafficking um, as this kind of glamorous side of this beautiful woman who just wanted to be rescued by a, a rich man, and that's what happened, which is a very glamorous way of looking at a very abusive practice. And then finally, I think the most common approach towards human trafficking is that they're just seen as human subhuman. The same in labor trafficking. They're just seen as less than an actual human being. That's how um, slavery happened in the U.S. in the past, is that individuals who were in slavery were just treated as non-human beings. They didn't have voting rights. They didn't have property rights. They weren't human beings. And that's how we treat victims of human trafficking. In one um, training session with law enforcement in our state, and again, remember, we have very progressive laws. We have very progressive training for our law enforcement officer. He was from the attend an officer was speaking with someone from the attorney general's office and said, oh, we don't have any human trafficking in, in our town, just a couple of old skanks. And skanks is a slang word to bas basically say somebody of low value, of low sexual moral, just kind of a throwaway person. Um, and, and he was saying, and he wasn't being, he wasn't joking. He was literally thinking to himself, oh, we don't have a victim. We have, you know, these bad people who don't have much worth that are doing bad things and couldn't frame for him. So to translate, um, laws and you know these higher level beliefs into actual practice can be hard. When you look at labor trafficking and, and those of you who've leaned heavily into the climate change uh, or the anti-climate change movement I should say, these are tied together very heavily because having cheap um, available consumer goods is very very much drives labor trafficking. So that material-driven culture contributes to human traffic in that way. I also want to look at an issue that's not often talked about, and that is the demand side issues. Who's looking for trafficking services, whether it's sexual or even labor trafficking? So if you look at sexual trafficking, for example, 
We know through research that those who traffic, what we usually call the pimps, those who are victims, those who are being trafficked, and those who buy sex, the johns or the purchasers of sex, are three different people. But the trafficker, the pimp, and the victim often have a very similar background. They, they tend to come from poverty, abuse, um, they tend to be minority or in other ways um, not the non-dominant part of the culture. All those risk factors I spoke of earlier, the victims and the traffickers tend to be and represent those populations. However, in the U.S., for example, the purchasers of sex tend to be white, middle class or professional, married males, by and, by and large. So who has more to lose in these situations? Well, for the traffickers and the victims, they already live on the fringe of society, so getting a legal charge or losing something of, of what little value they have doesn't mean a lot to them. But for those who have the, are invested in the status and, and wearing that mask of being in the normal range of society where they don't abuse children, they have more to lose. So that's where a lot more of our regulations are going to target, as well as working on the male side of men standing up and saying this is not acceptable, this is not okay, we're not going to talk about women this way, we're not going to treat women this way, we're not going to treat sexuality this way. Um, and, and then additionally, if somebody, imagine this, you have, you have the, the pimp, you have the victim, and you have the john. And a police officer pulls up, and the police officer um, is going to be middle class, you know, has, has, a, has a profession, has a career, um, has some stability in his or her life, um, probably going to be that typical um, mid-range kind of person as far as having family, etc. Who do you think that that officer, that law enforcement, is going to identify with? The, the, the pimp who is saying, forget you, and maybe has guns or drugs on him, um, the, traf the victim who's going to spit in your face and say, forget you, or, or this man with a suit and tie who says, I'm just trying to get home to my wife. With whom are they going to identify? Most That's part of the issue with labor trafficking and sexual trafficking is that those who are supposed to enforce the illegal nature of what's going on more readily identify with those who are purchasing these services. So in our state, for example, they did a, just a very small survey of, of um, oh, a year or two of who's being charged. And in my state, despite our progressive laws, we by and large charge victims of human trafficking with a crime of prostitution 10 times as much as we charge those who are victimizing them through either trafficking them or purchasing sex. So 10 times as many. So barriers. As you can tell, um, these barriers are, com are, are difficult and challenging because human trafficking is complex. It's systemic. It's not... A, when human trafficking first emerged as an issue in the U.S., it was seen as kind of the standalone over there human trafficking issue you have to deal with, deal with human trafficking. And what we now know is it's a complex systemic issue that's really woven into issues of gender, economics, race, poverty. And so it's not easy, it tend to be homeostatic that the systems in which we operate tend to self-justify. I have an article there um, from President Carter talking about leaving his religion of many years because the homeostatic way in which that, that religion maintained its position of um, oppressing women is why I have that article there. People with power don't easily release power. And finally, as I spoke up just a few minutes ago, the way the law is applied, even though the laws are there, is not necessarily equitable. We're still I those in power still identify more readily with the people who have power in the trafficking situation. And in that, it's the people who have money and look more like those who are supposed to be addressing the issue. So how do we step up to this complex challenge? If you aren't scared and running away and you're still with me, congratulations. You really shouldn't be. The good news is the risk factors show us the solutions. And just as pervasive as the problem is and the risk factors are, the solutions are each as pervasive. People think if they want to address human trafficking, they have to go out on the street and, and grab kids out of brothels and drag them out. Please don't do that. Please hear me. Do not do that. That is dangerous. Um, but when we address the underlying inequalities, the underlying gender, economic, um, even climate issues, the risk factors are reduced for those who are most likely to be impacted. 
The single most controllable factor we know from research, and I've seen this in practice, for youth who are um, at high risk of being victimized in the future, for youth who've had certain trauma and losses but then do okay in their life, the most controllable factor that they have, that, that all of us can do, is relationship. Is to have somebody who believes in them, who sees them as having value and purpose and worth. And that's something all of us can do. You might have noticed that in my um, list of all the boards I sit in and all of that, I have one that's kind of, to me, funny and sticks out, and it's the Newton Community Children's Choir. I live in a town of about 20,000 people, and that's our local um, community children's choir. And that's a, a kind of a small example of the kind of ways that you can engage in and show value to youth in your community. So anytime you're talking with that, that young person that you see every day on the way to work or to school and communicating value and worth to that child, asking them about their school, spending a few minutes, that's a protective factor you're building into that youth's life. It can be as small as that. It can be as complex as creating a curriculum to take to young people and help them understand about the risks of trafficking or even to providing services to those who've already been trafficked so that the cycle can be broken and they can then become survivors and leaders. So that's my broad overview. So I am ready um, to take some questions as we wrap up today. Thank you very much, Mel, um, for this really um, partly shocking, but also like really interesting and um, informative um, talk. Um, if it's okay, I would like to ask like the first questions and um, then you maybe um, can access as well the, the other questions. Like when I heard your, you talking, um, what came up in my mind was that when I was like really little, um, I asked my parents about and other and also teachers about like, um, why do we have prostitution? And um, like the general answer was that prostitution in general has like a function in society um, to prevent like a violation, like sexual violation. So now that I dig deeper into the whole concept and also reading more about prostitution, etc., I'm becoming like more aware of that actually prostitution is more like a systemic way of violation, but um, actually it doesn't um, it doesn't actually change that issue. So um, for me, this was like my little um, changing point in my mind, and my my question would be um, like the first question is. You said like that they um, the victims they don't identify themselves as victims. So why do you think um, is that? Is it because of the um, psychological protection and also because of what they have gone through and because they were influenced so much by their traffickers? And the second question would be like how do you deal um with this topic like because you're so into it and i guess you see like so many um horrifying things like how do you protect yourself from not getting um psychologically hurt um from all this Those are two great questions and two that either one of which I could spend probably a whole day talking about, but I won't. I'll take a few minutes on each. The reason why victims don't identify as victims is complex, um, but I'll tell you a few of the well-known reasons. One is that so often those who've been trafficked have been victimized their whole lives. One young woman, well, I know more than one has said this, um, one to me, and but my colleagues have heard this as well from other victims, that for, for youth who grew up in a, a household where they were sexually and physically abused, this might be the most control they've ever had of their bodies and their sexuality and their life. So yeah, people have been taking sex from them, taking their body from them their entire life, but now they have some control. They say who, who when, how. They get some money for it, etc. So that's one dynamic. Another dynamic is that, yes, the traffickers are so adept at what we call grooming them for being trafficked. That's another thing that I often point out to the victims who don't self-identify is I tell them 
did this happen, did this happen, did this happen? And they say, yeah, how did you know? And I'll tell them, that's what the young people I talk with tell me. And we know that that's the pattern of grooming you and preparing you. Now, it is true that we have what um, we call gorilla pimps. And gorilla pimps are going to grab someone. They're going to drug them. They're going to use a gun to force them to, to just break them down and, and, and perform these acts. That is much less common in my area of the country. Um, it's not necessary because we have so many youth who are psychologically vulnerable and wounded. All they have to do is figure out what's missing in their life and begin, be, begin to become that person. In fact, there's interviews with pimps that talk about if they don't have daddy, you become their daddy. If they need love, you give them love. If they don't have money, you give them money. You find what it is they need. They just act like somebody who cares about them, is compassionate. And so just as they're showing, they're figuring out what this kid needs to feel trusting and, and, and feel um, like they, they're counting on the pimp, and at the same time that pimp's going to be pushing away saying, you know, your mom's too controlling, your dad's a jerk, you need to cut off ties with them. And so that when, when, the, when the switch is flipped and they begin to ask or coerce them to traffic, they really don't have anybody to go back to. Um, and then at that point, they're going to, they often, again, do a very good job psychologically of convincing them that they've made this choice. You chose this. You did this. You owe me this. I did that for you. So they don't identify that they're a victim. They're identifying as I'm a person who got myself in a situation and I have to get myself out. Um, and there is also the Stockholm Syndrome, if you've ever heard that psychological syndrome um, discussed, where they begin to identify and be protective of their victimizers. So those are some really common, like, you know, it's just like any human um, phenomenon that, that each person is individual. So I, I'm always trying, I, I'm trying to be careful not to paint with too broad of swaths and say, okay, I'm telling you the truth for every person who's been trafficked. But these are the generally recognizable patterns of, of human trafficking victims. And again, remember, if they're getting them at this time of age, at this age, 12 to 14, when they um, are forming their identity, they identify as that. This isn't something that happened to them. This is something they are. So they're not going to identify as a victim. They're going to identify that this is part of who they are. So in terms of how I, I deal with um, being exposed to what we call secondary trauma, and that's true not just in the area of human trafficking, but in the in anyone who works with victims of trauma, um, I think you, you have to do a lot to protect yourself because people are vulnerable in this field to either become very depressed, emotional, have their own secondary trauma. You can be traumatized just by being exposed to tra other people's trauma. Or they become hardened. They come to the they come to the point where they're just, you know, at one point they used to care, but it just hurt too much to care and they can't care anymore. And the way I address that is I have a lot of healthy systems around me. So I love what I do, um, and it's a big part of who I am, but there's a separation for me that when I go home, I'm at home. I have a supportive family. I um, My faith is really important to me, and that gives me meaning, purpose, and support. I purposely uh, do things to take care of my physical, emotional, spiritual health so that I'm a healthy instrument to do the work that I need to do in this field. And that all that being said, there are times when I go home and cry. There are times when I go home to my mom, who's also a therapist, and she leads me through um, an anti-anxiety uh, practice to help me resolve the anxiety that I'm feeling because something I've been exposed to. There are a few stories that I've been exposed to over the years that haunt me, and I will never tell somebody else those stories because I don't want them to be burdened with the same images I've been burdened with. But I know in that moment my, my secondary um, exposure to that image through somebody's words is nothing compared to that child who lived through that actual act. And so that compels me to move forward because I feel purpose in it. And and as I said in the beginning, I believe having a sense of purpose to the work I do is very important to me. It's how I, I'm built. So having that sense of, of, of meaning and purpose carries me forward as well. Thank you. Are there, oh, yeah, there is a question from Paula. Um, she said, um, what about convictions for the PIMs and the clients? Well, that is an area, again, that is just emerging because what we're finding that with all the progress we've done in terms of providing services to victims, 
to, we're trying to do prevention curriculum in school settings. Um, we're trying to do a lot of education. We're trying to change the way we talk about this. We're changing our laws. So we're doing a lot of things to address this, but it's only recently that those who are traffickers and, and much less so those who are Johns, those who are purchasing sex are really being targeted and it's for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. So we, we're we not seeing a lot of convictions. We're not seeing a lot of property seizures. At this point we have the laws. Our laws are very strong in my state and our laws are uh, you know pretty strong at the federal, the US national level, but the behavior to actually follow through isn't there. And really what the prevalent thought is emerging is that until we address those who have something to lose, like I said earlier, the, the, the pimps and the victims don't have much to lose. When we start trafficking those who have a lot to lose, those who are purchasing sex, we're probably much more likely to see a change. Because it's not, most of these people are not um, sexual addicts and they're not pedophiles. Their, their sexual preference is not children. It's just that it's available and it's easy and the barriers are low. It's, it's a low risk behavior for them to get a certain um, response. So they, they can get something they want and the risk is really low. What might happen? A small fine. Now if a letter would go to their, I mean there's all kinds of things that have been looked at. What if a letter went to their wife? What if their name was put on a billboard? What if their name was published? What if they lost their license, either their driver's license or their medical license or their license to practice law? Those kind of things. And we have also really increased the penalties where people who um, participate in trafficking, depending on the circumstances and, and the kind of crime they're charged with, it carries equal penalties to first degree murder. So there is an effort being put into targeting that place where we're probably going to see more difference, but the culture hasn't shifted to begin to really execute those laws as written. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who um, has a question? If this is not the case, um, okay, then I would um, stop it here and um, I guess we will have uh, other really Im interesting questions in the next, um, in the next talk. And um, I thank you very much, uh, Mel, for, for your time and for this um, really great um, Melton Share session. And um, if anyone else has like later questions, um, maybe we could even like um, gather them and ask you maybe later to answer those questions if you're okay with that. Absolutely. And if anyone is wanting to engage in um, additional projects for the Melton Foundation around the area of human trafficking, I'm very willing to provide input or support or refer you to resources that might be helpful. So if you, if you or some of your colleagues on your campuses are wanting to do that, please feel free to use me as a resource. You know where to find me. Perfect. So um, thank you and uh, see you in three hours. All right. Bye. -bye. Bye.